all the participants to this community and uh, youth at the Center of the Science-Led Response in East Africa, a symposium that has been jointly organized by IAS and Muju collaboration. My name is Dr. Nelson Msova. I am the Director General of the Uganda AIDS Commission and the Uganda AIDS Commission is uh, a government of Uganda agency that coordinates the national multisectoral HIV response for both public and non-public sector agencies. This symposium is very, very important, uh, both for Uganda as a country, but also for the region, uh, the Sub-Saharan region and the East African region. Uh, the two-day symposium will enable us you know, learn, uh, get updates. As a country, for instance, although we've uh, registered success in the fight against HIV, we still have, you know, bottlenecks that we need to address. The high burden of HIV infections uh, among uh, specific population groups, the high level of stigma and discrimination uh, that is, you know, slowing down some of the interventions, again, especially amongst subpopulation groups at high risk, and issues around uh, access to treatment, uh, the challenges on uh, loss to follow up, and, uh, and uh, you know, the efforts around the new targets that have been set in the glo global aid strategy by UNAIDS, being able to achieve the 95-95-95 by 2025. So this uh, symposium is timely, uh, but also the more exciting thing about it is its focus on community actors. Because as we always say, we can sit as scientists, as doctors and design the interventions, but it is really those who are being impacted by these interventions who know best, uh, like the English saying goes, it's the wearer of the shoe who knows where it pinches most. So uh, the communities being part of you know, this discussion is really great because uh, during implementation, it makes it easier, but they are also sharing the frontline issues that they are they're experiencing. So the symposium is for two days. And uh, during the two days, it will focus on HIV treatment uh, for an accelerated uh, uh, focus on key and vulnerable population groups, especially within the East African region. It will also focus on innovative preventive methods, uh, both in Uganda, but also in the East African uh, region. Uh, and then uh, it will also focus on HIV among adolescents and youth, because we know that these population subgroups uh, is particularly affected when we look at adolescent girls, and young women as a specific group, we know how high, you know, the new HIV infection and the burden of the disease is in that subpopulation group. So throughout the two days, we shall be keenly listening and, uh, and hearing from our important stakeholders, uh, ranging from scientists, doctors, but also the community groups. It's now my privilege and honor to invite Professor Kenneth Ngure to introduce you know, this session in more detail and guide us through the next session. Thank you for listening to me. Greetings. My name is uh, Kenneth Ngure, a member of the IAS Governing Council representing Africa, together with Josephine Nabu Kenya, and I'm pleased to share some housekeeping rules with you. All participants, are currently muted. I invite that all those connected virtually to, pre to please introduce yourselves by typing in the chat or interactive box that is right underneath the screen. And you'll see that your message shows in the interactive box to the right of the screen. Please type your first name, last name, the organization you work for, and the country you are from. Let us use this opportunity to connect and get to know each other. If you are having technical issues, our, and are unable to see the chat box. I would like to invite you to change the internet browser and to select all cookies 
to be able to interact with the speakers when entering onto the platform. Please use the same chat box during the questions and answer time that will take place right after the presentations. You are also welcome to send comments in the chat box. We would also like to thank Viv Healthcare, Mark Sharp and Dom MSD, and Gilead Health Sciences for their support of this virtual meeting and for making this possible. As an active participant of the IES Educational Fund Uganda and East African Symposium, you have the opportunity to receive a one-year IES membership at no extra cost to you. The membership will be activated once you fill in the post-symposium survey and tick box in the survey requesting this membership. If you are already an IES member, the existing membership will be extended for one year. I am now pleased to give you the floor to you, to your moderator for this session, Professor Philippa Msoke. Professor Philippa Msoke is a pediatric infectious disease specialist from the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at the Makerere University in Uganda. Philippa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Nguri. I am Professor Philippa Msoke, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this symposium on behalf of Muju, Makere University, John Hopkins University Research Collaboration based in Kampala, Uganda. I'll be moderating this session, which will focus on HIV treatment for all, an accelerated focus on key and vulnerable groups in East Africa. This session comes at the right time as addressing stigma and discrimination on access to treatment must be integrated the HIV response for our region, for this region. There are increased challenges on providing HIV treatment for all and innovation on provision of care due to challenges that have recently arisen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic impacting East African countries. The community must be included in new approaches to treatment provision and recent developments in HIV treatment, such as long acting methods in the pipeline must be signaled and raised to increase the population's awareness on options that are provided and available in East Africa. I am therefore much looking forward to the many interesting presentations from our great line of speakers. After their presentations, the speakers will participate in a question and answer session, which I will moderate. During this question and answer session, you, the audience, will have the opportunity to ask questions to our panelists by submitting your questions through the chat box. We sincerely hope that this programming will be of value to you all for your current work. Thank you, you're welcome. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker for this session. I'm also pleased to introduce Jotham Mubanguzi, who is officer in charge and strategic information advisor for the Ugandan UNAIDS country office. We are very honored to have Jonathan Mubangizi with us this, mor this morning because he stepped in at the last minute on behalf of UNA to provide a perspective on the situation in East Africa and Uganda. A little bit about Mr. Mubangizi. Dr. Mubangizi has been the acting country director of UNA since November 2020. He has been the UNA Strategic Information Advisor for the last 12 years. He has been instrumental in supporting the strengthening of HIV AIDS ME systems for the country. He meets national and international reporting, analysis and modeling of HIV and AIDS and support prior Prior to joining UNAIDS, he had worked with several organizations, including 
Macquarie University, World Bank, Rockefeller Foundation, Catholic Relief Services, Infectious Disease Center, AIDS Information Center, and Mulago STD Clinic. He has a wealth of experience and expertise. He is a monitoring and evaluation expert with 23 years experience. He is a graduate of statistics, master's economic policy and planning of Macquarie University and several international accreditations. Therefore, it gives me great honor and a privilege to be able to introduce Jotham Mubanguzi to present on recent developments in HIV treatment in East Africa. Mr. Mwangizi, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Over. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Philippa, for the onboarding introduction. And I want to start by thanking the organizers for this symposium, for giving UNAID an opportunity to share on the on how the communities and the youth uh, could uh, participate and read on the HIV response. And I will take a few minutes to share with you the, on the topic HIV treatment for all an accelerated focus on key and vulnerable groups in East Africa. I will borrow a leaf since East Africa is part of Eastern Southern Africa, borrow a leaf on some examples from Eastern Southern Africa broadly and finally, I will zoom into the Uganda perspective. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, at the end of 2020, we witnessed across 40 million people living with HIV and AIDS, and of which Eastern Southern Africa hosted about more than a half of which then East Africa, Uganda, and Kenya continue to host, have the highest numbers apart from East, uh, South Africa. Also new infections continue to be the highest and also AIDS related deaths. And East Africa, Eastern Southern Africa continue to have more close to half of which Uganda, the East Africa in particular contribute the highest share apart from South Africa that continue to have the highest lion share. I have to say that uh, globally, uh, East and Southern Africa, again, continue to have the highest burden of HIV and AIDS response. On the second aspect, which is our discussion for today, is on the treatment and testing. That globally, We've been able to know uh, in terms of the 90-90% of people living with HIV know their status, and 90% are uh, know they are on treatment, and 90% are virus suppressed. That globally, the global coverage has been at around 84 uh, for those who knew status, 73 for those who are on treatment, about 66% those on virus suppressed. But we take note that East and Southern Africa and also Uganda in particular, continue have done well in the last decade in terms of, of, of the uh, treatment uh, cascade and they have achieved basically the 1990. But the, the, there is an unfinished business. The key population, the adolescent, young girl, the children, their treatment and viral uh, coverage are still low, especially in East Africa. And that's a worry for all of us. And we think we can be able to discuss today on the key things that we can be able to share and make a breakthrough. I indicated that East and Southern Africa continue to have the highest burden and we worry around the children and adolescent and young women. We also worry around the key population, especially MS men who have sex with men, transgender and commercial sex workers and fishmongers and adolescent young girls, their coverage in terms of treatment, coverage and prevention services still remain a worry despite the science that we have in the region and at the global level and all the tools that are available. 
but there is some hope. Uh, the hope is that uh, a number of countries have been able to make a breakthrough in terms of what has been able to be achieved. And also we hope that we'll be able to make a breakthrough as we move forward. But also we take note that uh, testing and treatment coverage for men still remains quite bad, not good. And basically, as you know, men uh, uh, adherence and also being able to seek services in the timely manner remains a challenge. Therefore, intervention that can be able to use, uh, uh, I recall that apologies. And, and also to take note that, uh, 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 to take note that, uh, adult, uh, yes, I was talking about the men, that again, the men, they go for treatment rate and also they have the challenges in terms of the treatment cascade. And that is something that we also worry about. Stigma and issues still remain high and challenging stigma and discrimination and human rights, especially in East and Southern Africa, and also in Uganda included. We've taken note of high levels of stigma and discrimination and human related abuses in these countries. They are uh, the human rights, the abuse, they don't associate, there is shrinking space, and this then impacts on the prevention and treatment aspect. There is high and mid family planning, especially for, adult, uh, for young women between 15 and 24. And this has been worsened again by the COVID situation, especially with the wrong closure of schools. And this is something that is worrying and we hope that we can be able to make a big breakthrough. Uh, I wanted to share with you, this may sound a bit crowded, but share with you that we're not doing well in terms of issues around punitive and discriminatory laws, especially in East and Southern Africa. And I've shared with you those which are in the green, is that yes, we are doing well, but you can see the entire aspect is in yellow or, or pink or orange, depending on which color you can see. And the laws are still uh, limiting access and prevention of treatment and uh, HIV services. And we hope that we can be able to make a breakthrough. My last two slides talk about that there is a hope. There is a global, uh, the, the countries and member states of the United Nations. Uh, in June passed the 2021 High Political Declaration and the 2021-2025 Global HIV Strategy that calls on escalating the aspect and reducing inequalities. Sajira can be able to address the issues, especially in Eastern Southern Africa and Uganda in particular, and priority interventions that are focused on basically to ensure that we expand high impact combination prevention services, especially for key population and adolescent and young people. And also to ensure that we preserve the gains we've had in the treatment and be able to move on. And rest address the issues of gender as a stigma and discrimination and address those um, issues where people cannot access the services that they want. And this is my last slide. My last slide said there is hope. The global aid strategy and the political declaration of 2021 gives hope for East and Southern Africa to be able to reduce the inequalities, to be able to reduce the stigma and discrimination, and ultimately be able to ensure in East and Southern in uh, ESA, we have had the, uh, the ESA commitment to address the issues around SRH. We also have the Education Plus Initiative to ensure that girls can stay in and remain in school. And if we do this, then uh, Madam Moderator will be able to contribute ending HIV and AIDS by 2030, and will be able to basically to achieve more aspects on, on ensuring that key population do not experience stigma and the girls do not experience stigma and we're able to address the punitive roles. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you very much, Mr. Mubangizi. We really appreciate this very interesting and important presentation highlighting some of the gaps and where we still have challenges. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Catherine Nguji. She's the head of the National AIDS and STI Control Program, NASCO at the Minister of Health in Kenya. And she will be presenting on challenges in treatment for all 
due to COVID-19 and innovation on provision of care. Catherine Guji, the floor is yours. You're welcome. Thank you. My name is Dr. Catherine Gugi, um, Head of National HNSA Control Program in Kenya. Um, I'll be presenting on challenges in treatment for all due to COVID-19 innovations for providing of care. In the presentation, I'm going to give a bit of background on HIV and COVID-19 impact uh, on, uh, on HIV services, um, as well as on innovations and next steps that we are undertaking. Um, you know, at the moment, COVID-19 has, it has been two years of pandemic and no cases are up to date globally, uh, almost 247 million, a total deaths of almost 5 million. In Kenya, we have had uh, confirmed cases of 252,409 and total deaths of 5,282. Um, in regard to HIV uh, programming in the country with the um, cascade of 95, 95, 95, we have approximately around 1.5 million clients who are living with HIV. Um, the first 95, we are 83%. The second uh, 95, we are 83%. And then the last uh, um, well, for the overall suppressed around 78%. This is both for adults uh, and children. We know um, that because of the COVID-19 when it hit us last year, UNAIDS did a modeling um, that showcased that with, if there's any interruption of HIV services and more so on uh, interruption of ART, that definitely to reverse gains made in fight of HIV pandemic, the probable increased number of HIV related deaths, and they approximated almost a million in Sub-Saharan Africa. However, we know uh, most of the um, systems and programs within Sub-Saharan Africa have been uh, resilient. And uh, with the restrictive uh, COVID-19 containment measures put in, it really impacted negatively on the services. For example, in Kenya, we had intercounty closure of borders with the election of police roadblocks, which restricted movement. We had night car views and restrictions of movement, closure of health facilities because of the infection of the healthcare workers and conversion of some of the health facilities to isolation centers or even treatment centers. In addition, definitely the initial uh, fears was among us, especially people living HIV, wasn't the impact as some shunned away from facilities due to risk of contracting infections. The potential impacts of COVID-19, uh, which all of us have been uh, worried about uh, since uh, March last year, was uh, uh, having new infections, uh, not only um, teenage pregnancies, new HIV infections, uh, in testing, disruption of HIV testing, in treatment, uh, you know, interruption of uh, the people living with HIV who are already on treatment, retention and adherence, as well as in prevention. Uh, the gains that we have made over the last two couple of decades being reversed. However, in Kenya, um, we had uh, uh, pre-COVID, uh, uh, the volumes uh, of the people who used to be tested uh, reduced um, and they were, they were quite high. However, in the March, April, we had uh, a bit of a reduction. For example, you can see from this graph, we had 32.6 um, a reduction of the testing and it's cause of, um, of uh, the previous studies have highlighted uh, some of the curfews and lockdowns. Community testing as well decreased by 71% amid state travel and meeting restrictions um, and as well as uh, the, the facility workloads reduced by 28%. However, we noted during that time we had ANC attendance and testing, it was not impacted um, at all. And uh, last year during the peak, we had a gradual increase in HIV case identification and uh, the lowest case of us was around April 2020, as per the previous uh, slide. Um, however, right now, we noted in uh, uh, looking at the data from last year, one of the uh, biggest uh, achievements, and I think because of the resilience program we have in Kenya, that none of the clients missed their medication. We still retained uh, um, uh, the, the many the 1.2 clients who are already on treatment. So was stable not only on retention, but as well as their viral load um, was, uh, was a stable. And you can see, um, uh, you can see the trend uh, since uh, last year up to now where we are doing. What happened is immediately that uh, in the round match when the, uh, uh, the lockdown was, uh, was uh, put in place in the country, we issued two circulars, one in March, 2020, and another one in August, 2020, 2020 as well 
to decongest uh, facilities and ensure continuity of treatment. Ensure that our clients uh, were able to take home more than three months of uh, medication for all clients, regardless of age and viral load uh, status. We scaled up ART delivery to the uh, among the CACs at community ART groups and ensure that distribution of ART to individual homes by community health volunteers, peers, and healthcare workers, and as well as allowing of access of ART from ERS facility during the COVID 19 pandemic. For example, you can see from this picture, um, this is a, um, a peer who is issuing, uh, who went to the facility, picked up the drugs under the community ART groups and is issuing to other clients uh, who were able to come and pick uh, at the community level. This was during the peak of COVID-19. As well, another innovation was mob mobile solution, a scaling up of innovative mobile solutions for appointment management, adherence support, and default tracing. And we know that we have around more than 400,000 clients out of the 1.2 million who are enrolled in Ushauri uh, mobile uh, solution in the country. Um, another innovation was use of Boda Boda for delivery of commodities in clients' place of choice. We enhance a lot of virtual engagement and outreach with the clients. Mobile dispensation of uh, methadone uh, through use of mobile vans. Outreach and clinical service and violence response during the time of COVID-19 provided for the KP programs. And as well, we did a scaled up uh, HIV self-testing to ensure clients still are able to know their uh, status, the ones who, are access who wanted to access that service. What was next for us was need to sustain uh, there's need definitely for us uh, um, now at least uh, things are a bit stable one year plus is to sustain and scale up some of the impactful innovations beyond COVID-19, intensify vaccination to reach optimal coverage for PLHIV and healthcare workers and adequate planning for HIV commodities to minimize supply chain interruptions occasions by COVID-19 pandemic and need to document lessons learned to inform policy and future service delivery for HIV during emergencies uh, and pandemic. Thank you very much and really want to appreciate the different stakeholders who have ensured in Kenya we are still able to continue our services and ensure that our clients do not miss not only on the medication but as well as on the services on testing, linkage and treatment. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Nguji for that very interesting presentation and the way that uh, Kenya was able to manage the pandemic and also take care of the HIV, uh, people living with HIV. Excellent. I'm now going to, I'm pleased to introduce Cosmia Lenz. This is a technical officer for adolescents and youth, technical leadership and program optimization at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, EGPAM. Unfortunately, due to the time difference, Cosima Lens is unable to present today as she's based in the United States. But we thank her that she has a pre recorded presentation which will be shared at this meeting. She will be presenting on models of care featuring IT, case study examples of best practices with virtual elements. Over to the presentation. Good afternoon. My name is Cosima Lenz. I am a technical officer for adolescents and youth at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, and I'm going to be speaking about leveraging digital and virtual platform platforms and elements and uh, discussing some case studies in the adolescent and youth response. So just in terms of context for EGPAP's adolescent and youth programming, we support over 144 children, adolescents, and youth living with HIV across 10 supported countries, which you can see on the graph to the right. And within this, there's about 116,000 adolescents and youth between the ages of 10 to 24 years. So this is sort of the breakdown of some of the case studies that I'll be jumping into today. I'm gonna highlight um, some examples with virtual psychosocial support, the use of a specifically designed app to support youth peer cadres, the use of virtual platforms for dissemination of information and tools, and the use of digital resources to support improved monitoring of trends and decision making. So during the pre-COVID era, virtual psychosocial support wasn't necessarily the standard of practice. And um, there were a few countries who were piloting the model over WhatsApp. And um, as you can see, Uganda and Lesotho in the square to the left, but um, after the COVID-19 pandemic sort of arose and the subsequent response with restrictions and lockdowns, a shift began. Um, and we began to be able to sort of leverage this 
minimal experience, um, but also the existence of these platforms to continue to stay engaged with adolescent and youth clients and discuss different topics ranging from mental health, social support, adherence, COVID-19, um, et cetera, while being facilitated by youth peers uh, with support from providers at the facility. The first case study I'm going to delve into is the development of a treatment literacy cartoon guide with the intentional integration of digital elements. The Committee of African Youth Advisors is a group of young people between the ages of 15 to 29 years from 11 African countries. Um, and they identified adolescent and youth tailored and responsive treatment literacy materials to be sort of a gap in programming. Um, a lot of times this was sort of complex or complicated uh, language in the materials that did exist when trying to explain these topics with it, within the umbrella of treatment literacy. So um, they, cre they created a cartoon guide with four scene cartoons that depicted different treatment literacy topics, and that includes U equals U, changing treatment literacy, sorry, changing treatment regimens, treatment fatigue, relationships, disclosure, all in youth-friendly language. It was intentional to include digital elements like animations of some cartoons and GIFs, while ensuring the format of the guide was also digitally friendly, as many young people were participating in virtual psychosocial support groups. And before we finalize the tool, we piloted the tool in five countries, both in in-person and in virtual support groups to sort of gather feedback and understand the feasibility of using it in these different settings. And um, the feedback was really positive. Adolescents and youth really enjoyed using the tools. They really enjoyed using the digital elements of the tools. Um, and so now it has been finalized and is being rolled out in our programs. The second example I'm going to talk about, um, well, there's actually two examples, but they're both under the Red Carpet Project. And the Red Carpet Project is a multifaceted, very important person, so VIP sort of focused, fast track, peer led model for adolescents and youth living with HIV. And this is both at the facility and the community level. So in Kenya, learners living with HIV, which are students at, at schools, for example, are connected to red carpet supported facilities and receive school-based support. Um, and this includes um, psychosocial support, adherence, um, disclosure support, et cetera. However, with COVID-19, in-person support was no longer feasible. So that support was transitioned to a virtual platforms. There were 99 learners that were transitioned to being supported over WhatsApp and youth champions who are the peer cadre support peers on some of the topics that we just discussed. So adherence, PSS, discussing ongoing challenges, while also ensuring that there's a space for young people to share their experiences among each other. We also trained teachers um, at these supported schools to provide DOT for learners who are struggling with adherence. And with COVID-19, um, there was an ongoing mentorship from providers from the facilities, from the linked facilities, um, and this was previously done in person, but now sort of transitioned into biweekly telephonic communications to ensure ongoing monitoring and support was provided. There is, however, limitations to note in terms of this sort of modality because there is limited accessibility and ownership of mobile phones and internet that makes it a little bit difficult to make this a more broadly utilized model. So in the same project, youth champions were trained on the use of tablets to support uploading and monitoring of real-time data of young people enrolled in the red carpet program at facilities. This supported and empowered youth champions and the multidisciplinary team to know in real time how, how clients were doing on adherence, in attending um, facility visits, viral load, et cetera, and to be able to respond in a timely fashion. The Red Carpet Program has a bi-weekly meeting that is attended by all project teams. So this includes the multidisciplinary team with counselors and providers and physicians uh, with also the youth champions. And so with this um, availability of this real-time data, it empowered youth champions to be able to lead these meetings on a regular basis. 
The next case study I'm going to speak about is the development of a peer educator app in Tanzania. So in speaking with the team, the challenge was presented that it was difficult to track peer educator activities and understand their impact and reach at facilities with adolescent and youth clients. So we decided to create a digital app for use by peer educators to support documentation in real time to track, track trends and inform decision-making for quality improvement. So the app is actually being piloted at the moment at a few select facilities with peer educators. Um, feedback is also being collected virtually. So this is over WhatsApp and through conference calls of the peers that are using the app. There are peer leaders who are chosen at facilities to sort of be the focal point or the champion to support the use of the app among their peers at facilities. And the data will link to a Power BI page where it will be visually accessible to sort of see the real-time data to support decision-making by peers, the in-country and global teams. So although there are some innovations in the digital space, there are a host of challenges that persist that need to be taken into account when creating virtual interventions. The first is accessibility. So this takes various forms. For example, accessibility of mobile devices. So at the beginning of the pandemic, as you'll see on the box, we did a landscape assessment in Kenya um, that found that only 11% of adolescents in supported facilities own their own mobile device. Accessibility also refers to the stability and the strength of consistent connection. And so that's an ongoing challenge as I'm sure a lot of us know, but this is also connected to affordability. So in terms of affordability, it's expensive to sustain and have airtime consistently. So there's always competing priorities for paying for, for data. And this actually should be taken into account, especially for young people and youth peer cadres so that financial support can be provided for them to be able to sustain these different interventions. A third challenge is around capacity. And this refers to the necessity to build digital literacy and skills in, util in utilizing these platforms and virtual spaces. Otherwise, the intention to actually use these in a meaningful way won't necessarily be recognized. The fourth item is concerns around privacy and confidentiality. So as mentioned before, the majority of young people have shared devices either with their families or their caregivers or their siblings where in the case that they're discussing sensitive information around sexuality, around sexual health, around HIV, they don't want that information to be visible by other people who are using the same device. So those concerns really need to be taken into account when creating these digital interventions. Lastly, it's important to be cognizant of the gender divide that exists in relation to mobile devices where young men have more access compared to young women, which has implications for reach and for programming. So with that, I will close with discussing some lessons and opportunities. The first is that digital platforms offer additional avenues for engagement and communication with young people. So this is really exciting. Expansion of digital technologies offers additional opportunities to build digital literacy and skills for young people and caregivers. However, it is important to be cognizant of the limitations around connectivity, around affordability and availability of devices that pose consistent challenges. So this means activities need to take those into account in designing interventions like ensuring that there's offline modes or privacy and confidentiality components like passwords, for example. And this is an unprecedented time in the, in the time of use of digital platforms and virtual spaces and programming. So it's an opportune time to recognize and scale models that work with the intentional integration uh, with additional services, for example, prevention. And with that, I'm gonna close. Thank you so much for your time. If you do want to follow up with me, I have put my contact on the screen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Cosima Lenz for your presentation and the importance of technology to support our young people. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Ruth Ledion Mashar, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the National AIDS Control Council, NACC, in Kenya. She will be presenting on 
successful case study examples of addressing stigma and discrimination related care in East Africa. Dr. Ruth, Marsha, the floor is yours. Welcome. Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Ruth Lebon Marsha. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the National Risk Control Council in Kenya. I'm delighted to um, uh, share with you a successful case study of how communities come together to address HIV-related stigma and discrimination. And uh, the case study I'll share with you is a case study of a community-led organization that has been doing some work in Kenya. Before then, allow me just to have a reflection of uh, uh, HIV-related stigma and discrimination and just point out that um, many of the people especially those who live in the HIV do face um, uh, stigmatization and sometimes that lead to discrimination. And basically, as we are aware, stigma is uh, where people devalue somebody uh, based on their own perception of what they have. And in this case, HIV, and for the key population, men who have sex with men, female sex workers, male sex workers, people inject drugs or use drugs, transgender people, they do face additional prejudice based on the fact that uh, they are also criminalized and also uh, the fact that they are also exposed to violence that uh, bring their risk of HIV and STI higher. So um, in the context of Kenya, uh, allow me to just uh, share a bit of data. Uh, some, one of the old data that we have, we have around 206,000 female sex workers, 50,000 men who have sex with men. 90,000 people inject drugs and around 5,000 transgender people. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we estimate that around 9 to 11% of the key populations who we find in hotspots are below uh, the age of 18. So we also have a large cohort of key population that are, uh, are young people. So uh, under such uh, uh, challenges such as stigma and discrimination, harassment and abuse, uh, the fact that they are likely to also have poor access to health services and um, uh, sometimes also poor social and emotional um, um, uh, linkages within which they can also be able to, 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 to learn from their families or to, to lean on their families. They also um, end up um, having uh, cases of isolation where then these issues become uh, more difficult for them to deal with. And as such, um, it's also important for us to reflect that uh, we know that these populations have higher HIV prevalence than other general population. And one of the other areas that uh, I would want to focus on is the fact that, uh, especially for men who have sex with men, uh, where a lot of times that uh, we find that uh, when we do studies on stigma and discrimination, we find almost close to 55% of people uh, saying that uh, your sex worker, for example, it, it is uh, you who is spreading HIV, or where we did one study in Kenya that would indicate that 45% of the people did opinion that did, they had the opinion that men who have sex with men and uh, people who inject drugs deserve to acquire HIV. So those reports do show that um, there is need to address um, uh, the challenge of stigma and discrimination among this group. Uh, that's also not just affected when they have HIV, but also for the fact that they do they are key populations. Um, in terms of the progress of eliminating HIV-related stigma in Kenya, uh, we are, uh, of course, uh, we have done some progress uh, in a recent survey done by people living with HIV. We've been able to uh, see that uh, we have done some progress, but uh, not to the target that had been set, around 44% and 26% of men of women, 44% uh, of men and 26% of women expressed that they would have accepting attitudes towards the people living with HIV. One of the other um, stigma study that uh, has was also done again by people living with HIV, uh, we still see sex workers reporting high stigma levels. And of course, uh, people living with HIV in general, uh, noting that uh, they also do experience uh, stigma either from the communities or from the family members. Uh, violence cases are still high and more importantly is to look at uh, violence among key population and the trend has not changed, especially 
uh, where um, there is both sexual violence and also at the same time violence uh, as a result of uh, um, oh, police officers, uh, which which has been meted on this based on the fact that uh, they are seen to be in conflict with the law. So allow me to just move straight to uh, share with you a case example of how a group uh, that has is, is a community-based group uh, was, has been able to address uh, stigma and discrimination. And I'll talk about OIMAS, which is a community-based organization. The group works with male sex workers uh, uh, and, and it was started uh, targeting male sex workers who are living with HIV. And one of the things that they seek to address is the gaps in, in, in healthcare and uh, also making sure that uh, they would then have a safe space where the male sex workers would come in and convene and be able to share not only as a support group but also access services. The OIMA Center has a health facility that is registered uh, through the master facility list in the country and therefore it serves as a, also as a treatment center. Uh, and one of the other areas that uh, OIMA Center does is to ensure that uh, it provides diagnosis to, of HIV to their members but also other support um, uh, strategies such as uh, structural support where they bring together their members and they contribute and they, they are able to uh, uh, do an income generating activity. So they do empowerment of their members, they promote and safeguard their human rights. They do a, a good job in ensuring that when one of their members is either arrested by the police, they uh, jointly do uh, an intervention to have them released and they also do partnership and linkages and uh, of course, looking at the access of healthcare. So um, I'd like to share uh, one of the program that they have that really has been uh, fruitful in terms of, of eliminating stigma. And this is uh, one on direct observation and treatment support group. And this program was started when uh, the community members noted that some of their members are not able to adhere to their medication. So they did implement a facility and community linkage uh, treatment model where the peer navigators would account for the members and also track the 14 peers, where a, a member of the OIMAs would come and get registered and disappear. They would actively either follow them within their uh, homes. And most importantly, they would then um, uh, set up a system where the person who has not been uh, taking their drugs would come and take the drugs every morning within the center, and then they would get additional support from the members. So as such, um, at the early stages of uh, establishing OIMAS, this intervention helped them to have uh, most of their members begin to adhere to their medication, and then they began thinking about other activities to empower them. Currently, they are also in the process of setting up community anti-refill groups and they are using the uh, campaign for undetectable equals and untransmissible as a strategy to ensure that uh, they don't lose on treatment. Um, the other element that uh, they have done is to bring up um, uh, the, the newly tested positive. The peer navigators make sure that, uh, especially the young, uh, PLH, the young uh, MSMs who, who would have a challenge of coming to the facility are taken care of and that uh, when they newly test positive, somebody is there to work with them. So um, allow me just to move and uh, just look at OIMAS as a model that uh, they were able to, uh, to, 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 to think through the COVID-19 uh, interruption. So they realized one of the challenges that they would have is that uh, with the lockdown situation, their members would have to be forced to go to other health facilities. So what they did, they, they quickly, um, put together a team, of course, again, of their peer um, navigators, and, and they looked at some of the conditions that they were going to be in. And they did go to the government and request that uh, uh, their peers be given passes for essential health workers, which they successfully were able to acquire. And as such, what they did for those who were not able to move out of their locations, they would go and refill their medication. They would also use um, an app system for people to order for condoms where they needed or lubricants, and then they would discreetly go and deliver them through the use of, of motorcycle taxis. And as such, uh, OIMAS uh, was one of the modern uh, case where uh, when the, a community-based organization is in touch with their communities and there's a challenge that like what happened, they would still be able to reach out their members without um, uh, them defaulting on their treatment but also ensure that the treatment program is sustained. 
Uh, the other um, um, model that they have used to ensure that especially the young uh, male sex workers are, are, are provided with services, especially those who refuse to come to the to the uh, center because of fear of uh, either being known as a male sex worker or being known of the HIV positive status, is that they now have a platform and this platform is used as a, as a, as a platform where you go and register. Once you register, you're able to, to ask for a service, including booking for an appointment with a counselor, being able to get a self-test kit delivered to your house, and also being able to, to talk to a peer educator for clarification of the issues that you need. So one of the uh, things that they have been able to eliminate through the use of the e-platform is to allow the young people to feel comfortable interacting with the system. And then by the time they come to a facility, they already uh, feel comfortable uh, and, and, and also being able to deal with their own self-stigma. So in four months, they had served 863 young men who have sex with men and been able to test uh, quite a number, 543, and, we, and they were also able to identify the positive and then leave them on treatment. So this platform um, and, and, and some of the models that OIMA has, has done then allows a group such as the, the one that is uh, over hidden population, who may know to, be, to come out uh, openly, uh, be able to fight stigma internally and uh, still continue uh, providing services to, to, their, to their members. So in essence, um, while we share that case study, I think uh, stigma and discrimination is one of the areas that has been of a challenge in the HIV response. And uh, for a long time, we have been across the world, been trying to put strategies in place. But um, it's very important for us to see that uh, if we do not systematically plan and budget for interventions that deal with stigma and discrimination, then it remains to become a rhetoric uh, um, talk within our programming. So it's important for us to know addressing HIV-related stigma and discrimination is a program. It requires resources. It also requires a measurement tool so that uh, people are able to know uh, the, the progress that they are making with the intervention. So I'll just end up here with a quote from Nelson Otoma, who is the director of the National Empowerment Network of People in the HIV, where he says that the commitment to leave no one behind requires that we eliminate HIV-related stigma and, and uh, stigma, human rights, discrimination, and legal barriers that impede access to health services. The barriers only serve to frame HIV infections and lead to worse health outcomes of people in the HIV. An effective HIV response must be anchored on the foundation of health justice. So in, in, in essence, uh, I think what Nelson calls out here for is that uh, we must ensure that we, we, we establish all our health intervention on our health justice or what maybe we call social justice platform that allows us to see barriers that are, are not obvious to every other member of the society. And this is the case that uh, we must do uh, fit in because we were able to see that uh, with COVID-19, there are going to be differential barriers in terms of what probably any other person living in HIV would face and what the members of their community would face and begin to see how they would address that challenge. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Dr. Marsha, for that important presentation because stigma remains an important problem for us uh, in the region, I think worldwide, globally. Now we're going to go to the question and answer session uh, because uh, it's an opportunity for the presenters to hear some questions and have the participants have their questions answered. So thank you very much to all the presenters. We're really, uh, they were excellent presentations. I'll just go through the questions as has been asked uh, in the order in which they were asked. So the first question goes to, um, Mr. Mbanguzi, the question is, thank you so much for the presentation on the good work in Uganda. You mentioned a number of challenges affecting young people's access to prevention intervention. And the question is, could it be that young KPs fear stigma, criminalization, limited social community space or conversion therapy targeting young MSM in Uganda? 
The question is, how are your programs supporting transgender communities in access to HIV prevention, testing, and treatment? Mr. Mubangizi. Uh, th thank you very much. I will be brief. Just first give a perspective. The country population is 42 million, 43 million people, of which about 75% uh, are uh, people below age 30 years, and about 69, uh, about 65% are aged below 25 years. And therefore, uh, the, there is a broader challenge around the young people in terms of engagement, but there are programs, there are dedicated programs, uh, especially through civil society and, the, and especially the key population groups, organizations that reach out to a number of the key populations and your specific references to transgender, they are dropping centers. The other aspect and what has been done in this country despite the legal environment, the public health approach to ensure that services are given in those de designated points, those continue to be supported by the broader partners, including the Global Fund, including the PEPFA, including the UN family and all the bilateral and multilateral partners in this country. And so they continue to receive treatment and prevention and treatment services, and they continue to move on despite the legal environment, their mechanism and the Minister of Health has also been able to support, continuous support for those services uh, in those dropping centers where they can get dedicated services. And we hope going forward, we'll be able to break that barrier and break that stigma. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, response. And we'll move on to the next question to Dr. Wuji. Say thank you for your presentation. How has COVID affected treatment adherence in the communities? You did mention that there was good coverage, the retention was high. Someone is specifically asking how adherence, treatment ad adherence was affected during the COVID-19 lockdown. Thank you um, for the question. In regarding to the adherence uh, among um, the communities, we had some who, um, as I reported, was a bit stable. However, we noted, especially in the informal settlements, not only in uh, Nairobi, but as well as uh, other parts of the city um, uh, counties in the country, that it was an issue um, because of uh, um, the priorities uh, the clients uh, had that time because missing a meal um, and going to look for the medication. As I put in, in that when the COVID-19 pandemic, we had it at the beginning, we had several lockdowns. Uh, meaning that uh, clients could not uh, be able to access, uh, uh, go to the facilities, even though as a program we had uh, um, uh, given, put in measures to ensure that they can be able to access. Yes, it was, uh, there was a bit of uh, um, disruption uh, in terms of adherence um, at the beginning, especially in uh, March, uh, April and May. However, from uh, June, July, August and thereafter, it has been stable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to another question in the chat, I just want to ask Dr. Um, Marsha about the delivery of ARVs to the community. And I think you showed that it was really well done in the, during the lockdown. But as you know, when you have border borders coming and other people coming to your home, um, they tend to be stigma because most many uh, people living with HIV get their treatment far away from home. And so having someone come to your home may be stigmatizing. So how did you deal with that, uh, with your successful access to care and treatment in the community, even using border borders? Uh, we will have uh, Sam from Hoimas respond to that question. Um, hi, um, my name is John Miner. I'm the program officer at Hoimas. So um, I can take that question. So for the um, deliveries through uh, peer navigators, first of all, they are trained uh, community health volunteers. Uh, and part of their training, of course, includes um, just ensuring that the client is comfortable at all times and uh, 
just prioritizing the client needs. So one of the things that uh, we've been recommending, and it's, um, it's a process that Hoimas has adopted, is just organizing on a delivery point, not always like delivering at their, at their doorstep, because then a lot of people live in apartments, it becomes suspicious if like there's a, there's a rider like always coming maybe with a, maybe a suspicious package, but uh, people tend to get comfortable if it's just around, you know, like 200 meters away from my shopping center, 300 meters away from my shopping center. That's how we've managed to uh, make it work while uh, maintaining the privacy of the clients. It also reduces the cost. Okay, thank you so much. I think it remains an issue anytime you have to do delivery in the community, but you raise a very important point, maybe having uh, the deliver or the border uh, be a, a little away from the home. Thank you so much for that. Then I'm going to merge uh, the last two questions into one question. It's about social, uh, how do you maintain confidentiality on social media? Um, any of you can answer this question. And then the other one is similar. How do you help youth living with HIV in partner choices? as they often fear to disclose their HIV status to their beloved ones because of stigma and discrimination. So they're slightly different, but maybe I'll go back and start with uh, Jotham and uh, Dr. Nguji, you can also answer, and, uh, and Dr. Masha. The two questions are how you have confidentiality with social media, because it's not on the, but we can address that. And then how do you help uh, young people living with HIV choose partners and also disclose their status. Over to you, John. Thank you very much for these two quick questions. And uh, I trust say that to address the confidentiality with the social media, I think in my view is to continuous engagement of young people, especially living with HIV, to be able to talk about, because the young people are full and engaged with the social media, to be able to post, put out the messages, to speak out in, for example, in the country of Uganda, we have the young people living with the, uh, the young positives, and it is a, a group of young people. And, and, and they have gone to the social media and they are the people who respond, they are people who post and the time they try to clarify. And that one, because they have, they, they, they go into it and they are living with HIV, then they are able to talk about it. And in a way, you continue to address the issues of social media with confidentiality. But also where they come out and then they, there could be a response, especially from the young people, because then when their voices come out, it becomes a bit a uh, different aspect. How do you help young people, especially if you to choose their partners? It remains, it remains a challenge, but I think what is important is to give out the information through counseling and social support, such that if there is consent, and if people choose out if their platform, then they are able to take a decision uh, that has an informed decision. So, to me, continuous engagement, continuous. In this country, Uganda, young positives in this country have been able to break some of the barriers we've had around stigma. They talk about it, they have gone out, and, 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 and they have, we usually have also, they arrange some beauty, uh, beauty pageants for, for Miss Uganda, for the young positive, and that has been able to break the monotony and uh, to break the stigma. And in a way, they are able to cope and choose their partners. To me, that's the way I can be able to talk about this briefly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Nguji, we have one minute. Do you have any comment, any addition, something different? From no, no comment. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Masha? We'll um, have uh, John make a comment on that. Yes, um, I'd like to specifically uh, talk towards the issue of confidentiality. So what we've tried to ensure as Hoimas, we've, uh, we've tried to really capitalize on social media, uh, especially the chat-based platforms. So what we've tried um, to make sure is part of our process is just having a, a specific social media person, just handling all client relations and uh, ensuring that all conversations, especially confidential conversations are kept within chats. And then when we require information from clients, we do not um, like necessitate like um, 
official uh, documentation. So like a nickname is enough for you uh, to get served and just talk to like a counselor or a service provider uh, or even get a delivery done. Um, and when accessing any service through social media, it should be possible for you to get served by one person throughout the entire process. So that's kind of what we've tried, just limiting the number of people um, interacting with you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, the presenters and also the contributions that have been provided to the answers. We've come to the end of this session and we want to thank the presenters for participating, especially during this special and very busy time of the year. I would now like to pass on to Josephine Nabukenya and Professor Kenneth Ngure to give some closing remarks. Uh, this is Josephine Nabukenya and uh, I would love to thank you, Professor Philippa, for moderating this session, as well as uh, thank all the presenters uh, for coming up with such uh, interesting uh, presentations. I want to thank all the participants, uh, both those that are here at Muju, but also those that are joining us online. Thank you so much for uh, raising all those uh, beautiful comments and questions. I uh, would love to let you know that uh, all these recordings will be made available at the IIS Educational Fund uh, Symposium platform in a week's time from now. So feel free to uh, share within your network, within your friends, but also to go back and revisit and uh, to get more information in case you've been uh, able to miss out something during these two days. I want to uh, let you know that um, I will be having our next session in the afternoon. So uh, please don't log out online and those that are here at Muju, uh, please enjoy the break and uh, ensure that you come back for our second uh, session. Uh, back to you, Kenneth. Thank you very much. Hi again. Please remember to participate in the survey at the end of this meeting to take opportunity to let the IAS team know that you're interested in becoming an IAS member. You will receive a free one-year membership as a result of participating in today's session. If you are already an IS member, your membership will be extended by one year. All participants will receive an email requesting that you fill in a survey to evaluate this symposium. Thank you and have a great mini break until the next session this afternoon. Take care.